Welcome to Athens Happens. I'm Ben Peters, a news editor at The New Political. Athens Happens is a weekly news podcast brought to you by TNP reporters dedicated to explaining the nuances of Athens and state politics. You can find new episodes every Friday at thenewpolitical.com, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever else podcasts can be downloaded. This week, we're going to discuss a recent form where community members voice concerns about a proposed change in city law that would allow short-term rentals, including Airbnb and Verbo, in residential neighborhoods. And, in another form, Ohio University faculty members examine data on university administrative spending and voice their desire to protect the jobs of professors and faculty amid a university-wide budget crisis. We'll also give an overview of an Ohio U alumnus who recently announced his bid to challenge U.S. Representative Steve Stivers for his congressional seat in 2020. I'm joined by staff writer Delaney Murray to discuss a recent form where community members voice concerns about a proposed change in city law that would allow short-term rentals, including Airbnb and Verbo, in residential neighborhoods. How are you, Delaney? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me back. Thank you for, so much for coming on. We really yeah. appreciate you. So uh, City Council recently put forth legislation mm-hmm. to allow for short-term rentals in Athens. It has not passed yet. They're still delivering it. Right. But can you explain what that means? Right. So basically a short-term rental is a rental for less than 30 days. Um, Usually people just do them for a weekend or a few days at a time. And specifically, this is going to allow short-term rentals or tourism housing. They're kind of used in the same. They're used interchangeably, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's going to allow them in specifically residential neighborhoods or they're referred to R1 neighborhoods in the zoning code. So currently um, rental properties are allowed in business zones or areas where rental properties are very common. So rental properties are very common around the university or on campus and so often those will be different from an r1 zone that you may see a little farther into athens city so this would specifically allow those short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods and that's really the big point of debate here so what what would be an example of a residential neighborhood as compared to something closer to the university right yeah so on the east side of athens which a lot of students usually don't go out there which they don't really have a lot of reason to but typically you'll see neighborhoods like I grew up in Athens and so I had a lot of friends that would live on Elmwood Place or Utah Place sort of those more quiet residential streets usually a lot of older people or families live out there and so really a lot of university students don't see them a lot Mm. Um, but usually I would say the east side of Athens is pretty well known for R1 districts of course they exist all over the city but those are a few examples so if you go out you know D State Street to buy groceries or whatever and you pass those smaller neighborhoods those are probably going to be R1 neighborhoods okay so there was a form last night right. uh, where citizens were you know, deliberating right. this matter. Who hosted this form? Right. So the zoning committee that's in charge of this proposal, they were the ones that hosted it. And they weren't really speaking. It was more of just a chance for people to air their concerns or questions. And uh, nothing was being voted on last night. So it was purely mm-hmm. more of what I would t- call a town hall situation yeah. where people would come and voice their concerns and also ask sort of rhetorical questions and kind of state like what they were concerned about, what they were supporting. Um, They could, you know, sign in, give petitions to the board, really any of the above. So really it was to let the citizens of Athens have their voice heard more than anything else. So what was discussed? So there were quite a few different things. So I would say this is really a divided issue at the moment. You Mm. have quite a few people that are opposed to it, but you have people that are supportive of it as well. So I would say the major thing that got up was concerns. Anytime there's something new, people are going to be worried about what's going to happen. Yeah. So I guess I can kind of start with concerns that are flying around about why people don't want this present. So I heard a lot of concerns from people that are living in R1 neighborhoods currently that are kind of worried about what will happen to their communities. If uh, tourists get to come in and rent homes, like through Airbnb or through really anything else, Airbnb is just a third party service, right? So Mm -hmm. really anywhere that they're going to be renting, they're kind of worried about what will happen with tourists. You know, Athens is a tight knit community. And a lot of people that are living in long-term housing, like in R1 neighborhoods, they're buying it because they want to be there for a long time. They want to raise a family. Usually they have small kids or maybe they have their parents living with them. So, you know, it's going to be different people that are in those neighborhoods than, say, younger people that are traveling in and out. Mm. And so they're kind of concerned about what's going to happen if people they don't particularly know are constantly moving in and out of a property nearby. I see. Um, A lot of people are particularly worried because, you know, Athens sees a big boom in people coming in for... Um, fest weekends, Halloween weekend, homecoming weekend, people that are coming to Athens to, you know, drink and be loud and everything. And of course, Mm -hmm. that's not the only thing in Athens, um, I should mention, but a lot, it's a really popular um, tourist destination for that kind of thing. So a lot of people are concerned about what would happen if you have people coming in for those loud weekends and making a lot of disturbance in neighborhoods with children and families and that sort of thing. 
Right. So that's one aspect. It's also more practical things. Like a lot of people talked about like their neighborhoods have very limited parking. Parking is not just an issue on campus. It's an issue all around Athens. A lot of people struggle to park in Athens, even in small neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They struggle with on-road parking, all sorts of things. And they're worried that people coming in are going to have more cars and that are going to, you know, already make limited parking even more limited for people that are there long term. So those are just a few of the issues that I really saw coming up from people that um, oppose this issue. What about people who support it? Right. So I will say I heard a lot of support from people that are personally interested in renting out properties. Mm. So I heard quite a bit from people that are already um, renting out properties or um, tourism homes. And I should should say they're different from what's being proposed in that usually they're renting out a bit more long term. So they're renting to a lot of international students, Fulbright scholars, um, traveling faculty, Mm. that sort of thing. Um, they're also, they may be in an area that already has rental properties around, so they're perfectly allowed to do that. Um, you can rent out um, tourism homes, either, you know, rooms within your home or, an, or I believe it's 250 feet. If a property is 250 feet of your home, you can rent it out. Like if you have a guest room or something like that, guest house in your backyard, anything like that, you can rent that out. So a lot of people currently have that and are interested in kind of expanding that further. Mm-hmm. Um, I talked to a few people that, you know, they want to refurbish their home and rent it out and kind of give back to the community in that sense. They want to refurbish these old historical homes. We get that because Athens has a lot of those, particularly in R1 neighborhoods. They want to refurbish that and help rent them out. So that was a big thing I saw from people that were in support. Um, they think it'll help tourism, um, you know, renting out to parents or people that are visiting for graduation or parents weekend. Mm-hmm. A lot of them struggle to get hotel rooms because yeah. you have a big demand of people coming in Athens all at once, all trying to get hotel rooms. You know, there's a limit there. And maybe some people don't want to, you know, catch up with their kids in a holiday in room. They want to have a little more of a personal space. Mm. Um, So that can all contribute to why it would be helpful. Um, So I will say a lot of people did see it as a business opportunity, but also an opportunity to allow more people to come into Athens and appreciate the scenery. So that was a lot of things I saw in support of this resolution. Which would you say that there are more people who support or oppose this legislation in terms of what you saw at this community? Like, what was the split? Um, in the spectrum. I would say it is pretty even at the moment, mm. or I don't want to necessarily say it's even because, of course, people that oppose or support might not have come to this forum at all, right. right? So I would say I saw a lot more people concerned, but also confused about what this would mean. Um, a lot of people were concerned about just, well, if people are going to come in, who's going to enforce them? A lot of people are pointing out like the code enforcement office in Athens, like in a lot of towns, is already pretty overwhelmed. So who would enforce, you know, like noise complaints, housing codes, that sort of thing. Like, how would this run in a way that's beneficial to both the people renting and in the neighborhoods? Mm. I saw a lot of concerns about that. So a lot of people were concerned and confused. I will say there seems to be quite a bit of opposition. There was actually a petition that was handed into the committee last night that had 251 signatures, I believe was the exact number, of people from R1 neighborhoods um, all over Athens that were opposed to it. Mm. So I will say there is a pretty large opposition right now. I don't believe I heard anyone um, approving of it or, you know, fully understanding it that wasn't interested in renting it out as a business, which is perfectly fine. You know, people are allowed Mm -hmm. to run businesses in Athens. But at the moment, I think there's a large residential concern, if not confusion, about what's happening. So that was personally what I saw. What are some of these confusions that uh, people who attended had? Yeah, well, I think it's kind of a mixture of things. Like, people are... You know, people might not understand because zoning codes, first of all, are confusing. So people might not be like, oh, well, I know someone that rents out a room or, you know, has an Airbnb or something like that. Like, weren't those always allowed? You know, they have a misunderstanding about, you know, renting in R1 neighborhoods, short term rentals versus long term rentals. Like for having a long term rental, you have to have a license. Right. So Mm -hmm. there's different rules at play there. And some people are kind of confused about what that means because they might not necessarily need to know what that means. Right. It's housing codes it can be confusing yeah so that's one of the things um also i know a lot of people are kind of confused and concerned about how airbnb works Mm. and you know how you get approved for an airbnb the logistics that go behind that like who is allowed to rent out and who's allowed to rent in all those sorts of things are confusing so a lot of people don't really understand airbnb because they might not have rented themselves or you know they haven't used it as a renter so they haven't gone through the process of renting out their home they don't know how that process works so I think a lot of it is kind of tied to just not being sure how the business aspect works, but also kind of not fully understanding, like, how you're allowed to zone or open businesses in Athens. And like I mentioned, they don't necessarily have to, but 
it can't be confusing when you're faced with something like this. Can you explain how Airbnb works? Yeah, so I uh, have never actually rented an Airbnb, so I'll just give you kind of my understanding. So Mm -hmm. Airbnb is a third-party rental service, right? So it's like Craigslist or any of those other things. You can put your house or guest room or a property you own um, up for rent on a website. Uh, People will rent it sort of like a hotel room. Mm -hmm. And they'll come in, usually, you know, say, we'll use the Parents Weekend example, right? A parent is coming to visit their child in Athens. They don't want to get a hotel room for whatever reason, or they can't get a hotel room for whatever reason. Someone is renting out their guest room. They'll come. They'll sleep in the guest room. Um, Usually they're responsible for, you know, having their own meals, cleaning up after themselves, you know, being a responsible guest, following the rules of the house and everything like that. Um, So that's kind of the whole system. So it's sort of like a bed and breakfast in the fact that you get the bed, but not quite the rest (laughs) of the (laughs) breakfast and the extra things. But Mm -hmm. it's just like you get to stay in someone's home and not a hotel. It can be a little more flexible. It can be a little more, you know, at home if people, you know, people think hotels are kind of plain or not very welcoming for whatever reason, and they want to stay in someone's home instead. Uh, So that's kind of what Airbnb is in the best way I can explain it. Um, Typically, you know, we've seen a lot of people in urban areas use it a lot more. I know like places like New York and LA have had them for years and they've had abuses of the system and also Mm -hmm. people that have been um, scammed or it's been abused in some ways by the renters or the rentees. And honestly, I understand the concerns. A lot of people brought that up that they read a news article that seemed really scary about Airbnb. Mm. And I think at the moment, it is a young technology, right? We see the same concerns with Lyft and Uber and any other sort of sharing service. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a time will tell, and that's a greater company issue. But I can totally understand why people are kind of a little scared to kind of see a service like that come into such a small community like Athens, because we're again we're used to having tight knit communities. We're used to having knowing all the businesses, knowing all the services. And it'd be kind of scary to bring it into technology like that for mm-hmm. sure. And so this, the short-term rentals is greater than just Airbnb, though. Right. right. Airbnb is included in the short-term rentals. It's not everything. Okay. So there are other services that use it. Um, what is it? Verbo? Like Verbo. Uh, Verbo. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is. I've never heard of it until I worked on this story, but apparently it's it's popular among some people. Mm-hmm. Um, another service like that. Or just people, you know, renting it like an Airbnb, doing a short-term rental service that is similar to that. Um, so Airbnb is just part of it. And I feel like it's the term that gets brought up a lot because it's kind of a buzzword right now. It's a yeah. popular business, right? It's a new um, brand. Exactly. But it's not, um, Airbnb does not equal all short-term housing or all tourism housing. It's just part of it. Mm. Is there anything else you'd like to add to this, Delaney? Um, no, I just think it's a really interesting story. Like I mentioned, I'm from Athens. And so mm-hmm. anytime something happens to the community that they feel strongly about, um, I feel like I hear about it pretty quickly because, you know, people that I've known my whole life get um, have strong feelings about it, and I totally understand. And it can be intimidating when something new comes into a small community like mm-hmm. this. And so I'm interested to see where it goes and kind of what gets talked about. I can see the concerns on one side and the benefits on the other. And so I'm very interested to kind of see how this goes. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. You too. Up next, Zach Zimmerman is going to talk about a uh, challenger to Steve Stiver's congressional district. Hello, everyone. I'm Maggie Prosser, editor-in-chief here at The New Political. Each and every day, I work alongside reporters, editors, producers, and managers who put their heart and soul into the journalism we produce. Here at TNP, we have the honor to tell the stories of the residents of this small town we call home. We're looking for local businesses and other ventures to help us continue funding for our independent journalism, including the podcast you're listening to right now. TNP would love to advertise for you through our website, our biannual magazine, or right here on Athens Happens. If interested, please send an inquiry email to execedit at thenewpolitical.com for more details. We hope working together can support both your initiative and fuel TNP's strong, reliable, and essential journalism here in Athens. Staff writer Zach Zimmerman recently spoke with an Ohio U alumnus who recently announced his candidacy for the 15th Congressional District of Ohio. Mr. Zimmerman is here to chat with us about it. How are you, Mr. Zimmerman? I'm all right. How are you, Ben? I'm okay. So you spoke with Joel Newby. I did. Who is going to be running for as a Democrat in Ohio's 15th Congressional District to take Steve Stiver's seat. That is correct. So who is Joel? So Joel Newby, like you said, is a former student of Ohio University. He is a native of Pickaway County, south of Columbus. While he was here... He was a member of the College Democrats, and mm-hmm. he later served as the president of the Graduate Student Senate. Yeah. Uh, he 
after Ohio University. He received a law degree from Capital University, mm. and he worked at the Franklin County Public Defender's Office. Mm-hmm. We should also say that while he was a student at Ohio University, he served as a communications director for the New Political. Uh, Yes, that is correct. So he is trying to take Steve Stiver's seat. Why does he think that he is the right candidate? So in his words, he has explained how if you look at the 15th district, Mm -hmm. uh, his entire life he has spent in the 15th district. He's from Pickaway County. He went to school in Athens. He lived uh, in Columbus. His mom used to work in Madison County. He said he believes he is the right guy for the district and not Steve Stivers, who he claims will only leave his home in Upper Arlington whenever it is convenient for him and he Mm. needs to be reelected. So what uh, what region does the 15th district cover in the state of Ohio? Like about where does it stretch to and from? So the 15th district stretches from most of Athens County mm-hmm. all the way out to uh, Madison and Clinton counties, which is out in western Ohio. Mm-hmm. It stretches up to parts of Franklin County outside of Columbus. And it's worth noting that uh, there are a lot of people that would say it is a very uh, gerrymandered district mm. for the fact that it stretches that far. And yeah covers a lot of random areas and puts them all in one Mm -hmm. did he so you uh spoke with him on the phone a couple days ago for you know an extended period of time did he mention anything about the district being gerrymandered uh he did he honestly believes that even though yes he agrees it is very gerrymandered uh the way the district is set up he believes it is a great thing for him like he said he has spent his entire life uh, in this district, and he has noted how were he to be elected in mm-hmm. November of 2020, hopefully he will be asking the same voters to reelect him in November of 2022, but that could depend on how the district lines are drawn. Right, right, because the census will be in 2020. The district lines for congressional districts will be redrawn in 2021. That's correct. So uh, on this in this phone conversation with him, did he get into the nitty gritty of maybe the kind of platform he's running on? So he uh, likes to describe himself as a very progressive person, and he claims to have a very progressive platform. Now, there are many aspects of his platform that he highlighted that are very standard for mm-hmm. uh, Democrats. Obviously, he is strongly pro-choice. He believes in universal background checks. He is a strong supporter of DACA. Mm. Uh, And he also, when discussing his platform, there were uh, aspects such as infrastructure, uh, not only improving physical infrastructure like roads and bridges, but also improving Internet access. Uh, He believes that can help in creating jobs and building off of Uh, people who, you know, Mm. self-start. He is very uh, pro-job oriented. That's his type of campaign and platform. He Mm. also shows a great deal of concern towards the environment and his platform. He is big on supporting farmers in the midst of uh, President Trump's trade war Mm. as well. Mm. So uh, how does he feel about one of the most important issues to Democrats across the country, which is health care? So... He, at the time, uh, at the time being, he is uh, a supporter of the current provisions. However, so Obamacare. So ob- yes, that's okay. correct. However, eventually, he would like to see a single payer system mm-hmm. in place. And, and he made a point of noting that that, along with issues related to uh, student loans and lowering interest rates, mm-hmm. uh, those issues. It depends on who the president is at the time and who his colleagues are, but he would like to see those types of things uh, put in place eventually. So he's an incrementalist, you know, making small changes to eventually lead to a greater change as opposed to somebody like uh, a Bernie Sanders who is more of a, uh, um, a revolutionary wanting to make immediate change. Is that fair to say? That's a perfect way to describe Mr. Newby. Uh, so I know he uh, spoke to you a lot about 
Ohio University students, since uh, that is a large portion of his, this district, what did he say that he wants to uh, do for students in particular? Uh, well, when discussing how to appeal to students in the 15th district, particularly Ohio University, aside from uh, making a small comment about how hopefully his fellow Bobcats can support one of their own, he, mm -hmm. uh, he put a lot of focus on the student debt crisis and how we, in his words, we not only need to eventually lower the loan rates, but he would like to see the government at some point intervene. Mm. In in stu paying off student loans, you mean? Paying off the debt. Paying off yeah. debt. Okay, so so like a, an Elizabeth Warren-esque plan. So he is not, just to be clear, he is not in favor of public colleges being tuition-free. Uh, he never made that comment. Okay. So. Interesting. Is there anything else noteworthy about Mr. Newby that you took away from this conversation with him? Uh, his campaign is, at least right now, it is very uh, low-key, but he seems to be pretty against the current policies of Mr. Stivers. Mm -hmm. uh, he railed against uh, Mr. Stivers' yes vote on President Trump's tax cuts back mm -hmm. in 2017 mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Stivers' stances on health care. And so he seems to be very against Mr. Stivers, and it seems like he will be looking to run a strong campaign against him while also trying to appeal to everybody within the 15th district. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, my political science professor, a really great guy named Barry Tadlock, just gave a general PSA at the end of class that uh, Joel Newby is looking to hire campaign staff, and he told the whole class, like, hey, you know, reach out to me if you're interested in getting connected with him. So... I don't know, just a PSA to anybody who might be interested in working for a, a congressional campaign. Uh, yeah, that'd be uh, that'd be very interesting. Like I said, at the time being, it's a very low key campaign. Mm -hmm. So I could uh, definitely see him, you know, starting off by uh, hiring students uh, here as he builds his campaign up. So okay. well, thank you so much, Mr. Zimmerman. We really appreciate you coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. See ya. Up next. Abby Neff is going to be talking about uh, Ohio University professors and faculty members' concerns with the budget crisis. Hey all, Sarah Horn here. I'm the digital manager at The New Political. And if I had to pick the best decision I made as a college freshman, joining this outstanding publication would be it. At TMP, I've had the experience of creating both compelling written and digital content. My understanding of local politics has also immensely improved. TMP makes integration between written and digital work for staffers a priority and offers a unique opportunity to have a wide portfolio of clips. Not only that, but working for this publication helped me land an internship in Washington, D.C. as a digital productions intern for The Hill. Our publication is award-winning, independent, nonpartisan, and run by a dedicated team of student journalists. Apart from its content, the new political has brought me some of my closest friends. The people who I work with make my job fun and fulfilling, and they never cease to amaze me with their kindness, collaborative spirits, and humor. If you too want to join the new political, come to our all staff meetings Sunday evening at 7 p.m. in Scripps Hall 210, or reach out to me at shorn, S H O R N E, at thenewpolitical.com. I'm joined by staff writer Abby Neff to discuss a recent forum where Ohio University faculty members gathered to discuss their concerns regarding the university-wide budget crisis and protecting the jobs of professors and other faculty members. How are you, Abby? I'm great. I'm a little tired. I'm pretty sure I'm getting sick, but that's okay. <laughs> These things happen. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for being here. So tell us about this event. So the OU chapter of the American Association of University Professors hosted this event last Thursday in um, Porter Hall. Uh, President Lauren Leibarger and its Vice President Julie White, who are both professors at Ohio U, mm -hmm. um, represented the organization at the event. Um, the organization, uh, spe specifically this chapter, advocates for academic freedom, tenure, and shared governance according to the mission statement on their website. Mm -hmm. Um, activities they host include roundtables and public events like the forum, um, while also they draft editorials and white papers with research 
that may not be readily available to campus residents and faculty had they like not had access access to it prior one thing actually today that happened and we talked about it someone spread flyers across the campus with like 10 things you didn't know about Ohio University mm -hmm. and it's all information from the white paper that was published on the AAUP's website. Oh, do we know who? Uh, we do not know flyers? who. We do not know who. Hmm. That's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. So what was discussed at this event among the uh, faculty members who were here? So there were a lot of things discussed at this event. There were there was a lot of data being thrown around but there was also a lot of discussion on kind of like the faculty uh, pushing against the administration. The purpose of the event was obviously to discuss the budget crisis mm -hmm. and its effect on faculty members' job security. Um, but it also touched on a lot of information that, you know, faculty senate meetings want to touch on, but they don't have time for because um, President Nellis and Provost Jalali um, often have to leave and they don't like that. The questions about the budget usually dominate um, their question time yeah. um, when they present and then they have to leave because obviously the meeting has to go on and address other committees. Mm -hmm. um, however, the purpose was possibly to develop solutions and let the university know that um, faculty members won't shy away from fighting against department cuts and firings of faculty members. Um, people, The people who presented, Jim Mosher, an associate professor, professor of political science, he's the one that presented most of the data um, about the university's budget and their spending, mm -hmm. um, which is also available on the AAUP's website. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, do you want me to go into all the stats <laughs> on the, the spending and everything? Yeah, I mean, just a, a few details. Okay. Gloss over. Yeah, so the statistics were obviously adjusted for inflation um, from the 1980s, but in-state tuition has continued to increase since the 1980s, mm -hmm. um, but faculty sal salaries have remained stagnant. Um, however, since 2011, 350 administrators have been hired at Ohio University, um, which is a 45% increase in administrative positions. Mm. Uh, Mosher's data showed an 88.2% increase in administrators from 2011 um, to 2017, but there was only an 8.8 .8 increase in faculty during that time. So roughly there are about 1,200 administrators to 1,100 faculty members. Um, some blame also has been about like the budget crisis has been on declining enrollment specifically with the declining number of college bound 18 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, however, Mosher said that that is not the sole cause. That should not be the entirety of the blame. There should be um, accountability held on the university as well. Um, he said in a quote, we're in an immediate crisis, we've been priced out, which means that he believes in the statistics show that the university expanded at a faster rate than it was receiving um, revenue. Mm. Yeah. Um, other people that spoke were David was David Ridpath. He is a professor of sports management in the business school. Um, he really mentioned the fact that students are paying more for the budget crisis than they realize, specifically towards athletics. Um, the university made a they basically erased it, like an athletic fee that students have to pay, but it's still somewhere in their like tuition. They're just not aware of it. According to Redpath, like $1,300 goes towards athletics from students. Ohio, Ohio University says that only about 5% of the budget is devoted to athletics, where Redpath explained that almost $20 million of athletic funding comes from the student's tuition. So every student at Ohio University pays X amount of money from their tuition to go toward funding athletics. What, like, athletic events, facilities? I think just the athletics department in general. Okay. And then they allocate the money to different um, sections of the athletic department and he also mentioned something that I thought was interesting um, the new director of athletics Julie Cromer and he respects her and he mentioned that in the forum um, but she believes in the front porch theory which basically means that like the athletics are the cleanest window that everyone sees OU through mm. and Ridpath disagreed with that because the athletics actually don't receive that much funding and don't receive that much revenue than um, people think mm. so um, yeah I mean Following that, there was a just a huge discussion, um, open forum for anyone to say whatever they wanted. 
Um, it was hard to keep track of who was not upset about the budget crisis. Julie mm -hmm. White, who's the VP of AAUP, mentioned that she would possibly like to see a walkout in the spring. Um, and a lot of professors agreed oh, wow. with that. Yeah, there was a huge round of applause after she stated that. Um, Ridpath also mentioned that, like, he asked about the possibility of unionizing to curb faculty cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like being a devil's advocate to that, some others claim that while, yes, the university and specifically the administration has been um, viewed as the enemy in some regard, they're still on the faculty's team, especially classified administration, with which is not directly correlated with executive administration. Class what is, can you explain those two? So classified administration is kind of just like people who work for the university, like financial aid, um, like management, and like people that work within like dorms, stuff like that. Like mm. It's like people work for culinary. Would that be an example of a classified employee? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I like looked up classified administration and there that was just a few of the examples i only skimmed through them okay i yeah. see mm -hmm. and what was the other one um just like management like managing like the physical aspect of the university i don't want to say like gardening <laughs> but just to that regard 